from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 104 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always by James Scratch, Dan Duggan. They were in Philadelphia at Lincoln Financial Field for the site of one of the most, I mean, it's got to be one of the most heartbreaking losses for Giants fans to endure in, in a long time. The Giants go down 27-24 to the Eagles on Sunday afternoon, dropping to 0-3, a game that, James, it felt like it was three different games in one. I mean, that fourth quarter, we could probably do a podcast by itself just on that fourth quarter. Uh, the Giants have a little momentum early. The Eagles take over. The Giants take it back. And and then somehow, some way, a 61-yard field goal goes in off the leg of a rookie kicker. And the bottom line, James, is, and we'll get through all the different aspects of it, from Odell to McAdoo to the game plan, they're only three, and this season is slipping away. I mean, I think there's an argument to be made historically that it's already gone. Uh, you know, look, no team has come, only five teams, I think, in NFL history have ever come back from 0-3 to make the playoffs. Last team was in 1998. Everyone, you know, the Giants are buried in the, in the division right now. Everyone else is 2-1. and one. You know, they're 0-3 in the conference. The Lions are a team that's probably going to be in the wild card hunt at the end of the year. So, you know, they've already got a tiebreaker against them they've lost. Uh, look, the Giants, uh, it's pretty bleak right now. I mean, yes, I guess in theory they could rally. But, you know, we were just talking about before we came on the air. Last year they had that, you know, Eagles – Bengals, Bears, Browns stretch where we thought they could have kind of have a launching pad after being kind of up and down early in the year. Uh, they don't have that launching pad this year. The schedule's really tough, and you know people can say, "Oh, they were two and three last year." Well, yeah, they had, but they had won two games, and they should have won a third against the Redskins. So I just think that obviously you know, they got to keep playing. You know, the season doesn't end here, but you know they got a they got a long, long, long climb ahead of them that they're going to get back into this. Dan, what was the the feel in that locker room after the game? Because their their best quarter of that game was the fourth quarter. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. They lost it. They're, they're only three now. But was there any sense that, you know, maybe something clicked there in that fourth quarter? Or, or was it a, a demoralizing feel when you were around the team after the game? You know, it's funny. I mean, it was obviously demoralizing. You can't come up with a more demoralizing way to lose, I don't think, than a 61-yard field goal when, you know, basically the worst case you're thinking there is you're going to overtime when they get the ball back, the Giants get the ball back with less than a minute to go. You're not thinking there's any way you're going to lose this game in regulation, and, and to lose in that fashion was definitely a little bit crushing. But I don't know. I mean, either this team knows the right things to say to us or they're, they're genuine. There's no infighting. There's no finger pointing. There's no, you know, no one's in there slamming the water cooler and saying that, you know, just throwing a tantrum that, you know, just exploding about how bad the season has, you know, started. They're all sticking together saying, you know, we got to get that first win. And, um, you know, I don't know if they even truly believe it, but they're saying the right things. Um, you know, one thing I will say is no one really uh, channeled Jim Moore, but there was at least no talk of playoffs. There's a few questions about just kind of the obvious stat of, you know, like James said, but only three teams making the playoffs and and pretty much from McAdoo on down. They said, well, we're not thinking about the playoffs right now, which you know is 100 percent the right attitude. You need to go out uh, and get a win. The one thing I'll say is, you know, Tampa Bay didn't look like world beaters last week. And you go down there and you get a win down there and then you get the Chargers at home. I mean, hey, they could get to two and three, but like James said, too, the other problem is there isn't that really soft part of the schedule. Nothing this team has shown suggests they're they're capable of running off, you know, six in a row or, you know, nine out of 11, whatever it was last year. Uh, but I don't think the season's over. I mean, if they lose on Sunday, it's over. I mean, I think that, um, you know, they're not they're not going to win the wild card. I don't think at this point you're already kind of digging too deep. Well, the, the margin of error is, is too thin there. So it's going to have to be the division. And, and the fact that every team in the division is two and one uh, just makes the hole that much deeper. Uh, but yeah, as far as, you know, just kind of in the locker room, I don't I think guys, they don't look at it the same way we do. They don't say, oh, you know, five teams out of a million have, have made the playoffs at 0-3. I mean, they put so much work in. This is what they do. They're professional athletes. Their confidence really can't be sh- uh, shaken for most of these guys. They think they're going to go out and win on Sunday and, and, and start a run. So, uh, I, you know, as much as people on the outside have already thrown the towel, I don't think, uh, you know, that's the feeling in the locker room right now. James, let's go through this a little bit because it really was an epic game. I and mean, you guys wrote so much about it and, and some of the plays that cost them this game. And, you know, there was a point in that fourth quarter. I mean, they went into the fourth quarter down 14 to nothing. The final score in regulation was 27-24. I mean, you could watch 10 more years of football and not see a game quite like this again. What stood out to you, James, in the way this game went? I mean, the one thing 
that that got me early was they had opportunities. They, they were moving the football a little bit on a depleted Eagles secondary, but they just couldn't cash in in the first half. And and I thought about that when when the game was over and they didn't have enough on the scoreboard. Yeah, they just I felt like if, if you go back and watch the tape, it, it was astonishing to me how dominant the Eagles were on the line, both lines. I mean, you know, Ben Matthew talks about heavy handed. Uh, he saw a heavy handed football team on Sunday. It was across the way. I mean, it, it's it was amazing to me how the Eagles just they just bludgeoned the Giants. I, I think obviously you saw that with the run defense. And then McAdoo, you know, in the first half, you have opportunities and, you know, obviously probably should have taken a field goal a couple of times. But just still, I mean, the toss play on third and one. That Red Ellison, from what I can see, I mean, look, we, I don't know all their assignments. It looked to me like I don't think a play was ever going to work to begin with, uh, but it looked like it broke down immediately when he allows Vinnie Curry to get penetration and Eric Flowers kind of gets – first off, I don't know why you're running a cr- critical third and one play that involves Eric Flowers, who just is so – he was kind of unsettled at this point to kick out and try to block Malcolm Jenkins. But in, and then down on the goal line, I mean, that play and the whole line got caved in. I mean, it was an embarrassing play. I mean, you know, Ben McAdoo says he wants it back, but still, I mean, to run that ball with nine guys in the box and to get completely avalanched uh, is not good. So I, that's why I took away from this game. The Eagles just, they, they came and they punched the Giants in the face, and the Giants were finesse. I mean, look at the big plays the Giants hit. You know, a couple of, you know, plays to Odell, slant to Sterling Shepard. You know, there was no power football from the Giants that they've kind of said that was going to be their thing. And, you know, it, it was proven all empty talk because the Eagles, the Eagles looked like an NFC East team on Sunday. The Giants did not. Dan, I know you wrote about the Giants run defense and, and how bad it was on Sunday, really how bad it's been the first three weeks of the season. The crazy part about this is the Eagles, the first two weeks, all the criticism of Doug Peterson in Philadelphia was run the ball more, run the ball more. They weren't running it. They only ran the ball like 13 times the week before. I'm looking at the box score right now, 39 for 193. They ran the ball right at the Giants all day long. Yeah, and, and I don't want to hear about, you know, they were worn down. The defense was on the field so much. The the defense came out and did well. They got three, two, three notes right out of the gate. The Giants offense actually, you know, mounted a few drives. So the time of possession when the Eagles got the ball late in the first quarter was in the Giants' favor, and the Eagles ripped off an 18-play, 90-yard drive with most of those yards coming on the ground, and most of those most of those yards come with Legarrette Blount just running it down their throats. So I, I mean, definitely the fact that they're 32nd in the NFL, which is absolutely shocking after being third in the NFL in rushing defense last year. Um, that the offense is. Uh, inability to stay on the field contributes to that. And late in the first two games, I think they wore down, especially the Lions. They kind of gave up one late run that really uh, kind of inflated those numbers. You can't make that case on Sunday. Like James said, they got beat up up front. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the answers. I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how it's happening. I mean, I don't know if people want to start to say, well, maybe Jonathan Hankins was more important than, you know, I certainly never thought he was. Um, But I don't know. I mean, guys guys just aren't making plays. I mean, there, there was some textbook, uh, from the Eagles uh, perspective, textbook blocking on some of those runs where every single Giants player is like they had a magnet and they couldn't get off a block. And then the one guy who was free a lot of times was Darian Thompson. So that's great game planning because he looks awful. He can't tackle anybody. I mean, it's this is the guy that, you know, we've all hyped. We've all, I mean, we haven't seen a ton of it, so we kind of bought into the Giants hype. But everyone hyped is this game changer of safety. My goodness, he it, it might really be time to, to get Andrew Adams back on the field because I, I don't know if it's the injury is, is still slowing Darren Thompson down, but he looks a step slow, isn't making any of the ball hawking plays that, you know, everyone you know expected out of him, and he just can't tackle. So that, that's a big problem. Uh, the linebackers can't get off blocks, like I mentioned. Uh, it, it, it's just a real problem, and it's just amazing to think this was the strength of the team. And again, it's you can't say it's, oh, they were worn out for being on the field because all you need to go and do is watch that 18-play, 90-yard drive when a team, like you said, who hasn't run the ball, showed no interest in running the ball, ran it down their throats. So uh, it's, it's everything. This team has to do the whole look in the mirror, go back to the drawing board, whatever cliche you want to use because no part of it is functioning at a level that's good enough to you know be where we expected this team to be after three games. Uh, the Thompson play that stands out to me, I think, is the the Corey Clement touchdown in the fourth quarter, where the Eagles ran it off tackle, and there was, you're, it was exactly the way you described it. Dan, it was, there was one guy to beat, and he just basically just ran right at Thompson because I don't think he thought Thompson could take him down, and and he did, and it was it was pretty much an easy touchdown for the Giants. Uh, James, let, let's get into some of the big big names and, and their role 
struggles in, in this game, good and bad. We'll we'll talk about the coach, we'll talk about the quarterback. Let's start with Odell Beckham, who once again, um, it was you know kind of a typical Odell Beckham you know big game where we're talking about him. His play is brilliant in moments that you you there's only a few guys maybe maybe just him that can make some of the plays that he does. But yet we're talking about antics that have nothing to do uh, with the play on the field. I mean, he made two brilliant touchdown catches. Um, but, of course, we're talking about the reaction and, and his reaction and his uh, the penalty that he garnered afterward for, you know, uh, acting like a dog and trying to urinate on the field. Joe, uh, just let's let's sit for a second. I mean, this is ridiculous that we're sitting here on a Tuesday. The Giants are 0-3. They lost to the Eagles on a 61-yard field goal. And we're talking about Odell Beckham Jr. fake peeing like a dog in the end zone. <laughs> And it supposedly was in response to Donald Trump, who's the president. Of, I mean, like it's look, like it's, Mad Libs for football. Like, it's like, it is. I mean, it's just. I mean, look. Here's you didn't think you'd be writing about this in journalism school, James? No, I, I did not. I, I wish I could get back in the time machine and tell fourteen-year-old <laughs> me. This is what I'll say about Odell. We might as well address the whole, you know, the Monday and the CNN, you know, producer or editor tweeting him and everything. Okay. It's entirely possible that maybe this, that was Odell's you know, motivation, sentiment, you know, inspiration to do what he did on the field was a response to the, the widely denounced comments the president made that you know, were a major story around the NFL this week. One, I don't know how effective a protest is if, if no one understands it until 24 hours later, and it you know, brings a lot of heat on you. Two, I don't understand why, if that was the case, why Odell wouldn't just say it. I mean, look— whether you agree or disagree, and I, I don't think our intention here is to get into all that, uh, with the, the demonstrations and the protests and, and what people are saying, the Giants had three guys kneel during the National Anthem for the first time on Sunday. You know, Damon Harrison, Olivier Vernon, Landon Collins. It was done, you know, respectfully. Everyone knew what they were doing. Landon and Olivier were, were very, you know, articulate and, and explained their, their motivations after the game. Uh, Damon wouldn't talk to reporters after the game, but he, he did release a statement on his Twitter account. I mean, you, there was no doubt about what they were feeling, where, where they stood, what they were thinking, and it was done in a very dignified, respectful manner. Uh, I think you can question whether that was what Odell did, and I think you can question whether that kind of undercuts whatever message you may or may not have. And that being said, there's a lot of Giants fans who basically just seem to be of the opinion that you know he's the best player on the team, he's the only chance the team has to contend so let him do whatever the hell he wants i don't really see how that's a good thing i don't really see what ben McAdoo's getting at where he, he won't even like address the situation i mean look his player did something that a lot of people find very offensive uh in the end zone and ben basically just keeps saying next question and it's cute and everything when you're winning but ben's zero three and he's zero three in large part because of what he's done as a coach and I think that Ben is going to have to realize at some point that the act is going to wear – it has, has worn thin. I mean he hasn't won anything here yet, and people are getting tired of that. But I will say this last thing before I take it back to you guys. In 2015, I, people may disagree with me. I feel that John Mayer and Steve Tisch, if they could find a path to justify bringing Tom Coughlin back for another season, I think they, they, they were looking to find that path. But I think the fact of the matter is that – Odell's actions against the Panthers and the way Tom didn't handle that, and then the debacle they had on Sunday Night Football in Minnesota when Odell was suspended, that was it for Tom. I'm not saying Odell got Tom fired, but I think that that was the last straw for Tom, and that's why he got pushed out. And I think Ben needs to be aware of that, because if you're just going to kind of let Odell do what he does, and and Odell's going to say, I'm going to do it again, and you have no response, and he does it again, well, then it's on you. I think that's a big point. James, I mean, you know, we can debate the the merits of you know acting like a dog, and if it was politically motivated, I'm I'm kind of skeptical because again, as you said, uh, you have this platform in the post game interview where you everyone is crushing you for what you did. You might want to tip somebody off at that point. Well, listen, this is why I did it. Uh, he has plenty of friendly. Uh, ears in the media that he could have just let it be known to them and they would have put it out instead. He, Chris he Carter, tweets. I mean, 
Chris Carter went on his show, and I, I think criticized Odell. I mean, if Chris Carter doesn't know what he's doing, and he's Chris Carter's kind of become the, you know the Ahmad Rashad to Odell, then I, I don't really know like what else there is. So. Right. I mean, he tweets it back to a you know you said a CNN I don't even know reporter or whatever who has like a thousand followers. You'd have to be following both of them for you to even see it. So it just wasn't exactly the way with a guy who has a you know bazillion social media followers uh, wasn't the best way to uh, to get that message out. I mean, what's the point of a protest if no one knows what you were doing? And again, I. I remain a little bit skeptical of that. Anyways, I think the bigger problem going forward, and listen, with Odell, it's always complicated. You have to say the team would have had no chance in that game without him, which is you know often the case. I mean, that second, the one-handed touchdown catch he made, absolutely ridiculous for everyone who always gets on him for doing all his one-hand catch routines. Uh, it, it has you know kind of on-field practical value because no one else in the league makes that catch. I mean, he is an unbelievable talent. It's why the Giants obviously put up with some of the stuff, but it, you just can't have anyone kind of be bigger than the game and the team. And again, I know it's not the biggest problem facing this team at all but when he says after the game basically i you know, I know what i did and i do it again and i don't care about the repercussions i mean that's just that's a tough thing to have said in a locker room and and as, as a head coach i feel like you at least need to say listen what he did was wrong and we you know we, we can't have it again it, it, McAdoo's biggest problem in my opinion with the criticism you know the eli thing blew up so much last week is he's just so inconsistent listen if you're not going to criticize anybody Hey, that's your approach, and, and guys at least understand you're being consistent. So Eli has a delay game. You just say, hey, uh, that's on me or whatever, or you downplay it. But if you're going to criticize one thing, it just opens you up to now you have double standards for everything. How can you not at least say that you would rather have Odell not pretend to be a dog peeing on the field and would really rather him understand going forward we don't want that? So that's where I think McAdoo is just so inconsistent. It's hard. Uh, I think it, it chips away its credibility. Um, you know, again, it hasn't been a problem in the locker room yet. I still feel like at some point there's going to be a tipping point. Um, and again, I, I don't know when that comes, but it just seems like the, the inconsistency and, and the fact that he just didn't even address, let alone what Odell did, but the fact that Odell doubled down, said, I'll do it again. I don't know. I just think that's a, a really bad message, even if you're not worried about the locker room. Uh, just to the outside world. I mean, at least pr- pretend like you have some sort of control over the locker room. And I, I mean, the, the, the first two touchdowns they scored this year, they got unsportsmanlike contact penalties after them. They just the you know the Brandon Marshall incident before the game, which we can get into. Um, you know, I mean, th- these are grown men. He's not a babysitter, but man, it just seems like there's no discipline uh, on this team. And, and obviously, that type of stuff comes out when you're on three. You can maybe hide it, or maybe it wasn't there when they're 11 and five, but. Uh, it's just everything's kind of coming to the surface. There's just so many. They're playing whack-a-mole. There's too many fires to put out, uh, it feels like, with this team right now. They had these <laughs> issues last year, too. I mean, all the stuff Odell did, you know, shoving reporters in the locker room. I mean, but they, they won, so it kind of got glossed over. I just don't understand why Ben can't just say, you know, what Odell did was inappropriate. You know, it, it's not becoming of a giant. I'm, I'm going to take care of it internally, but I'm not going to tolerate it. I mean, how hard would that be? It's not hard. I mean, and on top of that, look, what he did is just is stupid. And again, it's just like, well, what are we doing here, Odell? But on top of that, any penalty, Dan just mentioned they've had two, two penalties on, on two of their touchdowns and they haven't had many this year. I mean, that game was was close in every aspect. Like you can't just give away 15 yards for just being ridiculous like that. That's the part that gets me, whatever the action was. I know the NFL sometimes gets a bad rap for just throwing flags and now the guys have fun. I mean, this was silly, but even if he did something else that was just less silly or whatever, and he got a flag, like James, the giants can't go through that. They can't have 15. They're not good enough at this point to just throw away 15 yards for Odell to make a scene. Like that's the part that would drive me crazy. If I was Ben McAdoo. No. And especially because let's think this happened a week ago against Detroit, Evan Ingram, you know, scores a touchdown and he grabs his crotch and like, look, I, I thought his ex, I mean, look, I, maybe Evan Ingram didn't realize he was grabbing his crotch. But when Michael Jackson did that dance, you know, 20, 30 years ago, he grabbed his crotch. So therefore you did. But that's now here and there. But then they had the, the kick pushback and then Rosas kicks the ball out of bounds. I mean, they had this whole situation happen and be a mess. And I'm sure they discussed this. I, I would hope that they uh, they discussed this at some point. Uh, in between, you know, showing funny YouTube videos in, in team meetings, I would hope they they discuss that penalty and how that can't happen. Then it happens again. It's just the Giants have a discipline issue. It's not just the personal foul stuff. It's the penalties late in the game. You know, it's the holding. It's it's the the weird John Jerry delay game. It's stepping out of bounds. It's just 
they just they're not a very well run team it seems like right now and that starts with the head coach who you know is taking you know like one little piece of blame a week it seems all right, let's get into the head coach here and more than just the Odell stuff, Dan. I mean, I actually thought the plan for Sunday and the way they, they schemed the offense, it made sense. You know, get the ball out of Eli's hand quickly. It actually was doing well. I mean, the two interceptions changed what probably would have been an incredible performance by Eli. And, and that's I mean, that's just part of it. He threw two interceptions. One, he probably didn't throw it well enough to uh, Brandon Marshall and Rasul Douglas picked it off. The other one was tipped. But for the most part, they were they were in a good, pretty decent rhythm, I thought, throwing the football all day. They couldn't run it at all. And there are the play calls. I mean, the pitch on fourth down, the goal line stuff before halftime. I thought the plan made some sense, but some of the stuff in, in the game that just kind of made me shake my head. Yeah, no, I thought it was a very good plan. I mean, that's what they had to do. They had to mix it up. They had to do something different. I mean, McAdoo said there'd be drastic changes. I mean, there really weren't as far as personnel. Paul Perkins still the starting running back, you know, same offensive line. But I think the, the no huddle, you know, was an effective plan, and it clearly worked. I mean, they moved the ball. Granted, they didn't score until the fourth quarter, but, you know, they were, they were at the goal line. They were in the Eagles' territory a few times, and you know, they were unable to convert. Uh, but no, so I would say it was a good plan. My question is, is that sustainable? Can you play that way every week? And, and McAdoo basically conceded that you can. I mean, and, and they had their own penalties with that hurry up offense. Engram had a few uh, pre-snap penalties. They had the key one late where I guess Flowers wasn't set. Um, so there, there's obviously pros and cons. And if you're going three and out, uh, you know, in that offense, you're really going to attack the defense. So I don't think that's a, a long-term plan. But as far as for a one week, I thought it, it was a good plan. Uh, I thought Eli was phenomenal. I, I know... Uh, that's, uh, you know, he's become such a lightning rod. Um, you know, he threw two picks. You can't just say, oh, well, other than the two picks. I mean, you know, those count and those were costly. I really want to ask him, uh, you know, later on, on Tuesday, we'll see him. I don't know if he thought he had a free play on the interception of Marshall because he kind of just threw it up for grabs. And there was a flag on that play that you might have thought was 12 men or maybe a, uh, an offsides because they let the play go through. But it ended up being, uh, I think it was an illegal shift on Ingram. And, uh, but you could just see the way he stayed on the field after the pick. It seemed like they might have thought that was coming back. So uh, not to excuse it because you still got to you know, make a better throw than that. It wouldn't hurt if your 6'5", 230-pound wide receiver makes you know, some effort to, if not catch the ball, at least not let the defensive back just you know, make a nice, easy, over-the-shoulder catch there. That was poor effort, I thought, from Marshall. Uh, the other pick. He's got to see the linebacker there, but I'm and again, I'm sounding like an Eli apologist. You throw 50 slants in a game. At some point, the defense is going to catch on. I mean, that, that was the problem I thought with the plan is, where, you know, they, they, they had the one double move to Odell for a touchdown, but I think you needed to, to mix it up a little bit. I don't know what the Eagles plan was. I mean, did they not watch the tape of the first two games? You have to press the outside receivers. Don't give them all those, you know, six, seven, eight yard completions, which you know, obviously the shepherd one took it to the house. It can really hurt you, but you press them because you have the safeties over the top. I know their, their secondary is decimated, but I don't understand why they let Eli just pick them apart with those slants all game. And again, eventually, uh, you know, the dam kind of broke and they were able to make some big plays off it. I thought that throw to shepherd, uh, you know, I put this on Twitter. I mean, anyone who says Eli is physically done. I mean, that throw answered that question. That was an absolute bullet. Uh, in a tiny window with three, between three defenders, hit him on the run, and he's off to the races. I mean, granted, you can say he's done for other reasons, and you know maybe his decision making has gotten worse, or uh, just playing behind this offensive line, he can't get it done because he's you know not too fleet of foot. But his arm strength is still there, you know, and I think he showed that. Um, so I'm kind of rambling here, but <laughs> overall, I thought it was a good plan. Um, you know, even the stuff with not playing Shane Smith, the fullback. Chase Smith hasn't really played that well uh, in the first couple of games. And if you're playing a hurry up offense, it's obviously uh, not much of a role for a fullback. I think the bigger question with Shane Smith and with Red Ellison is kind of why are they on the team? You know, why, why did you keep a fullback? It's clear that that's really not going to be a big part of what they do. Red Ellison, you gave the guy four years, $18 million, and you play him 30% of the snaps. And as James said, he hasn't played very well either. So it just kind of goes back more to the, the evaluation. I mean, McAdoo, it's, it's hard to change your spots. He's, you know, he is what he is as a play caller and as a coach. So uh, it seems a little bit like trying to fit, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole here because these guys just don't fit what they're doing. And through three games, it's pretty clear because they're not playing. So um, that that's not so much a game plan question. That's more of just, uh, uh, you know, putting your roster together. It just seems like uh, kind of a waste. I mean, I don't know why you gave a guy four years, $18 million who doesn't play. I'm not sure who they're bidding against. I don't, I can't imagine there was a, a big market for Red Ellison based on what he had done in Minnesota the last couple of years. So uh, that's just a an overall head scratcher. Um, but I don't have a huge problem with them not playing him a ton on Sunday because you were running this up-tempo passing offense. So obviously uh, you'd rather have Evan Ingram on the field. What I don't really get 
is, you know, as Dan said, you know, you look at what happened, you know, last, like, why did they sign Ellison? If they want a fullback, why did they land on Shane Smith, you know, an undrafted rookie who, you know, really hasn't played well? I mean, let's, there was a lot, there were multiple fullbacks available in free agency. I think, you know, Patrick DeMarco was on the Falcons, went to the Super Bowl, was one of them. Uh, Kyle Justick, I, I probably mangled his name, but I think he got the big deal in San Francisco. I mean, even, you know, local guy, Michael Burton from Rutgers, you know, the, the Lions waived him. I'm sure the Lions called around and said, you know, does someone want to give us a conditional draft pick for this guy before we waive him? You know, it seems like the Giants could have gone out and gotten a proven NFL fullback if they wanted a fullback. Instead, they brought an undrafted rookie who had a good training camp, uh, really hasn't seemed to elevate his level once the regular season started. And then Ellison, I just – that money and, you know, no, you really can't get out of that deal until – after 2018, so it's not like they can cut bait now and just say they made a mistake. You know, it's just he's not playing well, and I just wonder. It's almost like they signed these guys to a, appeal to pe- people who were calling for them to to get a blocking tight end and a fullback, and now I wonder if they're just not going to use them. Well, if they don't use them, it's just going to be a waste of a roster spot and make things more difficult on the guys you know that they do, do actually use because they become more predictable. Um, but I agree on Eli. I don't, I don't think he was – Close to the reason they lost this game, I thought. I mean, he's completed 73.5% of his passes so far this season. I don't think he's been uh, the problem as much as other things are the problem. But now and now as we look forward, guys, they're 0-3. That was a heartbreaker. But before we'll get to the Tampa game and, and moving forward. But I did. There was one thing I just thought of we didn't touch on yet. We probably should. What was your reaction, guys? I, I want both of you just as it re- could kind of go back in real time. Watching the final minute of that game play out. I mean, the kick was a miracle kick. I mean, that kicker may never hit a kick like that again in his life. I mean, you kind of just have to shrug your shoulders when they attempted the kick. It went in. But the fact that the Eagles got a kickoff was shocking to me, James. I mean, the Giants get the ball back less than a minute to go after Elliott ties the game. The Giants, I kept thinking to myself, just make sure the Eagles don't get the football back there. And after I think it was the first hit completion, I think I tweeted like the Eagles might get the ball back here. There's a lot of time. They have timeouts. How's McAdoo going to play this? They have to punt. Wing has a bad punt. I just don't understand how the Giants let with seven seconds to go. I think it was seven or eight seconds to go on the clock. Let Wentz complete that pass on the boundary to Jeffrey and let him get out of bounds. Like the whole thing is mind boggling to me. It's the fact that we even got to the Elliott field goal. I think it, it starts with the Giants on their final offensive drive. It seemed to me that they were like – they were kind of trying to get in field goal position, but they were also kind of trying to play for overtime. Yeah. So you have the completion to Ingram. I think it was like seven or eight yards. They don't call timeout. I don't understand why you don't call timeout there. You have three. you know, kind of. So instead, they rush up to the line. They let, I think, 15 seconds run off the clock. They get hit with an illegal shift. They end up burning the timeout anyway because they have to get a 10-second runoff, you know, th- to avoid that. Then Vereen goes out of bounds. I mean, that was it right there. Was the, that was the moment I said the Eagles might get the football back, you know? And look, I, but I feel at the same time it's like Vereen's going out of bounds if you're trying to like if you're confident that you're going to keep moving the fall and you're going to try to get in a field goal range. But at the same time, I, I think the Giants have to make a decision at that point after the penalty. Okay. What are we doing here? It seems like they kind of were one foot in, one foot out. And in the play to Jeffrey, I mean, look, it, it is a little funky that that only took six seconds. But you got three guys in the vicinity of him. I mean, knock the ball down. Do something. If you – it's just it, – it was just very – it was not well executed at all. And I don't know what the Giants really – if they had a plan. It just seemed like they were reacting. And then, look, if you open the door like that – Sometimes a kid's going to knock in a 61-yard field goal, and, and your season's basically going to go up in flames. Dan, what did yeah, you Joe. think as that was going on? Yeah, I mean, I talked to Eli Apple after the game, and his his responses were just kind of head-scratching on what he was thinking on that, uh, you know, the second-to-last play that got him into field goal range. You could see what the Eagles did. They sent uh, trips receivers on the right. One guy went deep down the middle, and, and DRC stayed with him. They had one receiver run, you know, a little like four yard out route to the sideline. And then they had Jeffrey run, you know, I guess it was a 19 yard out route uh, on the same side. Now, in the middle of a game, that's a nice little concept. And if you really like Apple, you have to kind of pick. Do you, do you press up on the short route? Do you split the difference? Do you fall back? 
But in that situation, who cares if he throws a four yard out? I mean, that, that does absolutely nothing. It doesn't get him in the field goal range. It's basically going to kill the clock or leave them with time for just a Hail Mary. And he said, as head scratching, he tried to bait Wentz into throwing the deeper ball. Like, why? Why would just take that out of the equation? Just fall back. It, it might go against the, like I said, the, the strategy in the first 59 minutes and, and 50 seconds. But in that situation, why are you trying to bait him and get an interception? Just don't even let that be an option. Let him throw the little check down. The guy runs out of bounds, you know, two yards downfield with four seconds left. It, it accomplishes absolutely nothing. It was just, it just goes back to, I'm not saying discipline in the same way of, you know, with Odell or with Brandon Marshall getting into a, you know, a, whatever you want to call it with a, an Eagles fan on the field before the game. Uh, that's kind of to be determined, I guess, but uh, it's not that type of discipline. It's more just football intelligence and discipline. I mean, the, there was a timeout right before that play. The coaches have to, uh, you know, express the situation here. They need to get to X yard line. We can't let them get to X yard line. So don't worry about anything short of that. Anything short of that, there's just no way they're going to, I mean, 61 yards is, is basically the, the max for pretty much any kicker's range. So anything less than what they gave up there. And we're talking about overtime. Uh, and then obviously there, that was the mental mistake of just baiting Wentz into making the throw he wanted to make. And then, the physical mistake, Jeffrey just wanted the ball more because Jenkins and Apple were both in position. Apple's drifting backwards, again, trying to get an interception. Just stand your ground and knock it down. And Jenkins somehow decides to kind of wait, hang back, and try to hit uh, Jeffrey. Instead, he hits Apple. So, I mean, it was just a complete disaster. So, again, it's the offensive series. You know, James covered pretty well. I, I don't understand the thought process there. On, on second and 18, when you, you check it down to Vereen, just stay in bounds at that point. I mean, you listen, there's, you know, there's about 30 seconds left. Just let's just get the overtime there. And they, they basically got lucky that they made it close on, on third and 15 to, you know, to hit Engram to, to at least make it interesting there where they almost got the first down. But uh, and then you get the wing punt to his credit, you know, he fell on the sword and, and, and blatantly admitted that that was just, you know, obviously I'm not going to use the language he used, just a bad punt. Uh, but so it was all three phases. Funny how McAdoo talks about complimentary football so much. Uh, offense, special teams, and defense, you know, all contributed to that. And I'll throw in coaching because the whole plan uh, was off. And again, the fact that they didn't uh, enforce the fact or, or stress the fact that you just can't give up a 19-yard pass in that situation. Uh, it's just it's it's why you're an 0-3 football team. It, it, a lot of things have to go right for you to go 11-5 like they did last year, and pretty much everything did. A lot of things have to go wrong to be 0-3 with the amount of talent they have, and it seems like pretty much everything is going wrong, and, and again, that's how you end up in this situation. Yeah, it's a good point. Everything, everything, especially in that last minute, I mean, it all was the opposite of what they needed, including a kicker who couldn't make a 30-yarder last week, hits a 61-yarder. James, Giants throwing three. You mentioned it earlier. Tampa is next. You guys are going to be in Tampa on Sunday, uh, a game that looked – a couple of weeks ago, really difficult. Tampa did not play well this past week in Minnesota against a backup quarterback. So there is maybe a little bit more intrigue that maybe they're not as ready to win as people thought. But who knows? I mean, the NFL week to week, everything seems to be unpredictable. Just looking forward, though, I'm more fascinated by how the Giants play than if they actually win the game or not. I mean, if if they win a close game, they, they win. If they lose, they lose. But are they going to come out with the way they played in the fourth quarter with that intensity and, and play again and, and – you know, can they get back up after Sunday? I guess that's the question I have now. Because that, that's the kind of loss that, that – that's more than just a loss. That was demoralizing in a lot of ways. What do you expect on Sunday, James, in terms of the way the Giants play this game? I, I Honestly, Joe, I, no clue. I think this is one of those games that uh, – I know we've kind of you know really hammered the guy for the past couple of weeks. But this is kind of a big test, I think, for McAdoo. He's got an 0-3 team. Uh as Dan said, it seems to be kind of holding together for now. Uh, you know, if they show up, do they not? I mean, look, if they don't show up and they lose badly and they go on four, this thing could get really ugly, I think. I think – or, you know, if, if, they, if they show up and they happen to lose and they're on four, I mean, it's not good. But I, I think you at least can say, OK, well, they're fighting and then we're going to kind of do it again against the Chargers. And it's going to kind of become this win watch basically. But – if they show up and they win the game, and look, I, I don't, I was not as high on the Bucks as some were coming into the season. I think they got a shot. I, I have no idea what to expect. It's kind of a weird game. You know, you're, you're going to Tampa, it's a team you're you're familiar with, but you don't play a whole heck of a lot. You know, four o'clock kickoff on a Sunday. You know, it's just. It, I think it's a big test for McAdoo. Does his team show up? 
Uh, obviously, you you need to win the game, uh, but I, I think at this point, if win or at loss, I mean, it, it's kind of the same thing. It just does the team show up. Because if they don't show up and they get embarrassed, then you're basically going to be 0 and 4, having played one good quarter of football out of 16. And I think you really might. I mean, it's going to be very hard, in my opinion, to keep this thing, you know, from out, from not becoming a full fledged circus if you're 0 and 4 and you basically have played 12 good minutes of football. Yeah, Dan, you mentioned to start this show. I mean, this thing isn't over yet in your mind, and it probably isn't because nine and seven can still win this division, even though everyone's two and one besides the Giants now. But this this feels like it on Sunday. I mean, the Eagles game was a kick when they were down, but they ha- they have to go win this game in Tampa to have any chance to make this a season. Do you agree with that? Yeah, no. I, own, I mean, zero three is one thing. Zero four is just. I mean, the the. the mountain becomes way too tall to climb because then you're now you own four in the conference. <clears throat> and again, I, I agree. I think nine and seven, maybe 10 and six at best wins this division, but you know, someone's probably gonna be three and one. You can't be that far back that early uh, in the season, but I do think they'll show up. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm strangely optimistic. And I, again, I don't think they're going to fully turn it around. And I'm saying they'll win. I don't think they'll come out and lay an egg. I just, I think there's too much talent on the team. I think at some point they're going to play a good game. Maybe we saw it at least offensively in the fourth quarter, because it's funny, obviously the offense finally steps up and the defense lets them down. And I have a hard time blaming the defense too much only because they carried this team for, you know, to an 11 and five record last year. And they kept them in the first two games this year when the offense did absolutely nothing. So eventually they were going to have a letdown. They were going to have a bad game. And it's kind of unfortunate that it coincided with a, a very winnable game. Uh, but I, I think they'll show up because I don't think they make that fourth quarter comeback. If the team is checked out again, what they say to us may not be what's going on behind the scenes, but they are presenting a unified front. I mean, they do seem to, you know, still have some level of belief and maybe that's, you know, naive or they're, you know, they don't, you know, understand the reality of the situation they're in. But I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that they're going to go down there and, and just say, oh, the season's over. I mean, it's only three weeks in. It's been a bad three weeks. Um, I think they'll come out to play. I mean, I don't know if that's going to be good enough for win. I think Tampa's pretty good, but again, they didn't, they didn't look so hot in week two. Uh, so you shouldn't go down there feeling like that's, you know, an unwinnable game. Um, you know, I think a, a desperate team uh, tends to step up. You would have thought that would have happened uh, on Sunday. I think the Eagles might've just been the better team. Um, but yeah, I, I think they'll come out to play. I think it'll be a good game. I'd be very surprised if this team rolls over and, you know, gets blown up by three touchdowns. It will be fascinating. The Giants in Tampa on Sunday, 0-3, trying to get their first win uh, as October hits. James, as always, thanks for doing this. I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about again next week. You got it, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Never a dull moment with these guys. There never is. This team, 0-3, but they are fascinating. Thanks to all <laughs> of you for listening to episode 104 of Talk is Cheap. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're there. Leave the show a rating. Helps us grow. We'll keep bringing it to you every single week right here on NJ.com. 